Well, here we are at the Rose Hill race course. You might be wondering why we're here at the race course. Well, we're not here to race horses. We're here to hear about bees because this is the fourth annual bee conference, which is pretty incredible. And the best part is we've got to meet some really interesting people here. And if you happen to like this content, we might do a little bit more of it. We could even travel to see where these guys actually come from. And first off the ranks is young Stu and he's a champion. He's actually the inventor with his son Cedar about the flow hives. And I tell you what, we're really privileged to have a chat to him and I hope you enjoy the interview. Good on you, Stuart. Thanks for making time to see us. Well, we're, I tell you what, we're fans of, the, of your invention, the flow hive, it's pretty incredible. I was sort of doing a bit of like know, online mining, as you say, with a little bit of research. And um, obviously people sort of, I don't think they appreciate just how much research went into making that actually get from, I don't know, yeah, a vision no, a in your shed. Thing. It was a long time, 10 years-ish, mm. something like that. And it's surprising how long it takes to get something ready for market. It, mm. it, you know, you can have the original idea. And the original idea was just Cedar saying, there must be a way to get honey from a hive without opening it. And I was thinking, nah, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, can imagine, I can imagine that conversation at the kitchen table going, nah. And then, and did you um, do in the father thing? Did you relish some of the failures when you sort of like? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I, did, I didn't say, nah, there's not. Yeah. I was just thinking, mm, I doubt this. But, but I'm in it for the ride, you know. Oh, yeah. It's good fun to, and even that night, we started imagining, well, how would you get the honey out of honeycomb for a start? Not out, quite out the hive, but even out of the comb. Would you suck it out? You know, what would you do? And usually that conversation, you know, just ends there. Yeah. Um, we do it all the time. But this one, Cedar came back and said, no, no, let's think some more about this. And then some of the things that we sort of were dreaming up in midair, he went away and tried to make them. And yeah. that was like a surprise to me. It was like, wow. He is serious, and that just started a ball rolling very, very slowly at first mm -hmm. of ideas, trying to make them, waiting to see if the bees would even go anywhere near it, fill it, cap it. Because one of your original concepts, I thought, was like they're trying to get the actual caps off, like, like we do as when we're normally harvesting. Was that right, or was that just something that I read? Yeah, we had the idea of pulling the comb apart uh, vertically, um, horizontally, mm. and the honey falling there, and that could have been or having something the capping sat on and pulling that off, but the honey still has to come out. Mm -hmm. And we found that even with the comb being halved horizontally like that, we did that. We made that, and well, Cedar mainly made that, and we put it in the hive and the bees filled it. And we pulled it apart like that using a diaphragm, you know, a, made out of an inner tube of a truck and that sort of thing to yeah. pull them apart. And the honey just stays there in each bit, just like when you're a beekeeper, one test for if your honey's ripe or not is give it a shake for some of the uncut stuff. And if it's if it's ready, it won't come out. And if it's nectar, it'll just get on your feet. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly what happens. Yeah. So, I mean, we knew that. And that's another interesting thing about inventing is that, which I didn't know before, is that you might as well make your best idea, even though you know it's not going to work. You might as well make it and try it because you're going to learn something and you'll get inspiration of another thing in that process. Whereas if you just say, oh, bugger it, that, that won't work, then that's a sort of dead end and you don't learn any more then. I'd encourage people to make what their dreams are, you know, what they're dreaming about, even though they know it's not the final thing. It won't be. You're gonna make dozens and dozens, way more than you think you're gonna have to make to get to anywhere near market ready. Absolutely right. I mean, that's the fascinating thing about being human, isn't it? You know, like you, because there's, I have a brother-in-law who he'll, he'll spend a lot of time trying to make it perfect before he starts. And I'm a bit the other way, I'm a bit like you, I think, or, you know, like that idea of, well, this is, this is a reasonable idea, and if I put that into place, and then, as you say, you'd like, go, no, actually, that's, I'll tweak that, change this. And then, I, I'm still fascinated as to how you come up with the simplicity of the idea when you crack the hive, that just the crack the frame, that's slightly different. I guess that's just evolved because you thought, well, why doesn't no, that we, want to we come We tried out? lots of, you know, we thought pistons, maybe pistons, pushing it out would work, you know, and all sorts of ideas that got made and didn't work. And that, that idea only happened because Cedar and I were working together. It happened to be me. Started looking at the hexagons saying, well, what if you split them vertically and had that, you know, half a cell displacement so therefore you get a channel 
I remember struggling with it, drawing it out and not being able to draw it right. And I'd even, I hadn't even realised that I'd actually turned the cells with the flat, the hexagonal flat side up. And usually the bees will make them with the point up. But they don't, it turns out bees don't care which way up a hexagon is. I had the flat side up, which allows that splitting. If you try and do that with the point side up, you can't split it in the same way. So, uh, really? anyway, I was half visualising, half drawing. Cedar looked over my shoulder. Just, it was a breakfast with him one day. Mm -hmm. He said, that's it. He could see exactly what I was up to. Yeah. And he went, wow, that's it. And in a way, to his credit, he just dropped all the other stuff we were working on. Yeah. Said, no, this is the way. And so then we had to figure out how we're going to make this. We had to sort of make it so that it could put an experiment in the beehive and would it work. Even now, 3D printing isn't quite good enough. 3D, it just about is now. You can get 3D printers that'll print quite fine, yeah. but you need it. I mean, you have a good look at wax honeycomb, how fine the wall is. Oh, Beautiful, yeah. so thin. Yeah. And um, so the only way to make that was injection molding. But by then, neither of us was working as much in our old jobs. We're running out of money, and we certainly didn't have the money to set up an injection molding. So that's where my dad came in and helped. He said he'd pay for that bit, which I'm very grateful for, but he was getting excited yeah, about what see, we were doing. Yeah, you can see the potential. Yeah, and, and that's another thing to say about inventing is it's pretty hard by yourself. We had family, my dad, my brother helped, mm -hmm. borrowed money from him just to live on uh, later on. because yeah. we, And so there was that belief in us and the willingness to, yeah. to lend some money in this open-ended way that families do. And that was really, really important. That's amazing. That's, a, that's some serious commitment. So you must have really, like, you know, when you get down there and you're, and you're saying this can actually work, like to put, basically put your life aside in a way for that mission. I did do that, but I'd been working in my old job for 17 years and I'd sort of had enough of it. And it was a community based, community sector job. And I was getting into more and more arguments with my management committee. It was just time to leave, you know, and, but meanwhile there was, so there was the push out of that and there was a pull towards the inventing. Yeah. Didn't know if that was going to bear fruit, but. Um, yeah. But might as well give it a go and then, you know, look for some other work when I had to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it had to work. I like that. That's the attitude. <laughs> yeah. That whole crowdfunding thing, that fascinated me when you finally got, like, everybody knows that part of the story, I think. Yeah. But the, the amount yeah. of effort that would have had to go to get something to actually be able to say, this is actually going to work, is like, I think that yeah. part of the story got missed completely. Because we'd found out the invention as a prototype to beekeepers around the world before all of that. Yeah. to get their feedback because we we could make it work but you know often the inventors can just do that little fiddle that you're not even conscious of to make yeah. to make the thing work and no one else can you know it's just them inventors because they know it so we had to make sure that people had never seen it before it would work for and um and their feedback and so on so for it did work and and then as you say crowdfunding it might look like an instant thing but well, we put a lot of work even before crowdfunding in. Well, how do you bring something to market? How do you raise the money? Yeah. And should we go for angel investors at banks or how, how do you do that? And we went and saw a whole lot of people that had been down that pathway. We talked, there's no shortage of business advisors that'll tell you what to do. Oh, absolutely. You yeah. need a plan. And we thought, yeah, yeah. How, how can you make a plan for something that's completely unknown in the market? There was nothing like it. We had no idea. The feedback we were getting from the people testing it around the world was everything from, fuck, oh, that's incredible, you know, swearing and yeah, yeah. with, with and, and we go, oh, wow, <laughs> to, oh, oh, it might, they might like it in Europe, <laughs> you know, yeah. just really deadpan and nothing. Yeah. Oh, and so we didn't know yeah, yeah. what was going to happen. You know, we knew it was unknown and therefore how can you make a plan around that? So crowdfunding, CETA found out about it first and um, then we both studied it and we together we'd go along to these, there were people um, running little weekend workshops on it and they'd have 30 or 40 people come to these workshops and we were there and they'd tell their story of how they did it and start talking about the important points. So we were learning and you can study it online and you can, a good thing to do with crowdfunding also is to um, is to put, to, to back some other projects. Just like you're hoping other people will, will back you, I backed quite a few different projects 
um, just to get the feel of what it was like to be a sort of pledger or whatever you get called. Yeah, so you know both sides of the coin somehow. And so yeah, we put a lot of work into it and found out um, the fo there's a standard formula for the movies that you make. Mm -hmm. It's worth following that, you might as well. And then it turned out that, that Mirabai, my stepdaughter, is, was a really good filmmaker. I mean, she'd studied it and was working. Unreal, that's incredible. And now here we are, you've got 100,000 units at least around the around whole the world. planet. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's, um, I bet you have to pinch yourself every now and then from like, yeah, absolutely. You know, like it would have been a wild yeah. ride, I would have thought. Like, it's been from... a wild ride and I'm still surprised. I, that wasn't, I mean, I only had a vague idea of a plan for my life, but that certainly wasn't in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so, it's, a good, it's a good result. I'm though. grateful, I'm very, very grateful. Surprised and grateful. Yeah, one, right. of, one of my things I love about your product is because, you know, obviously people ask us about the whole thing, and I think, well, a flow hive is actually a piece of useful furniture as well as a beehive because it's so pretty and so nice in your garden. It's just, you've gone to a whole lot of trouble to make it like look that's, amazing as well. That sort of happened by accident. We're tinkerer beekeepers, so we're always playing around with other things, and we assumed, in, you know, which seems stupid now, but back then we just thought, most people will just buy the frames and they'll take a circular saw to their boxes and make them fit and we'll give them a template for that. And then Cedar said, well, some people might want the boxes already made up. And I thought, oh yeah, well, we could do that. We can make up the boxes. He said, so if we're gonna make a hive for our frames, our frames are special. I want the hive to be beautiful. And I went, oh, that hadn't occurred to me, <laughs> you know. But I got into it with him and designed the slope roof and stuff. That's how it came about. I don't know if Cedar had thought about it, but I hadn't thought about the market implications of making it nice looking. I hadn't thought that there'd be all these people who wanted a beehive but didn't want what I'd grown up with, which was the half painted rotting box in the corner of the yard, yeah. you know, the bees leaking out one end, both ends of it and all of that. Yeah. I just, it just hadn't occurred to me to do anything different. That Cedar, <clears throat> was sharing his pride of the invention, saying, no, it should be in a good looking box, was the main push for that. And I thought, oh yeah, fair enough. But yes, it opened up into this market of people who said, yeah, I want a beehive, but I want it good looking. It's gonna look nice in the yard. And about that, it reminded me of, um, in the early days, lots of people, including friends of family and stuff, bought, bought the hive to sort of support us. And, and my dad was visiting one of his friends who'd done that. He'd, put it together and painted it and stuff and was sitting in his lounge room, in the middle of the lounge room. No, and no bees of course. And so dad said, so you're gonna get round to putting, when will you put the bees in it? And, and this bloke said, oh, I don't know about the bees. I just like the look of it. I think I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> we just go, what? Yeah. You know? <laughs> We didn't really put that into the yeah, formula. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't the thought. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a beautiful look. Like, yeah. anyway, credit to you. I like that, That you know, it just gives it that feel. Because, I mean, the, the market you're yeah, going with is, you know, basically the, the garden market. Well, so well it, that's what happened. Originally, when we realised we could do it, it had those first prototypes actually work in the paddock, we were thinking commercials. We, we hadn't, you know, it's an example of, well, you don't know what's coming. And we thought, well, is this a useful invention for the world? Oh yeah, this should make it cheaper for commercial guys to harvest honey. That was our thinking. Yeah. We didn't know how much it would cost per hive and all of that. And, yeah. and we do have some systems so you can automate it, which we've never put on the market. So we thought this is for commercials and we hadn't thought about hobbyists so much. And then we started to and say, oh yeah, this is gonna be make it easier for people that don't have the strong backs and or might have wrecked backs or whatever. So we realised, oh, it might help commercials. You could kit out a whole, you know, a thousand hive apiary and not have to shift everything to the honey shed yep. and all that. Mm -hmm. We were wrong with that. But that's our thinking in those days. And the amateur side of it, allowing access to beekeeping to a whole lot of new people, um, that's what took off. And, oh, absolutely. And yeah, well, that's, that's our yeah. audiences. Uh, yeah. I find it interesting that it... A lot of our audiences, that's where they start with a flow hive. Yeah, and, you know, that's and then that hive needs splitting, and then the next thing you know, they've got 
Usually, there's usually two flow hives, and then there's several others that have been other yeah. hives that end up, yeah, yeah, and they, and they right. just fall. I mean, as you know, as soon as you fall in love with bees, you're in trouble. Yeah, usually, you know, like you're you're, you're done. You're done for it. Like it's just, they're lovely. just so adorable, aren't they? It's, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what it is about them. I think they're just yeah. magical. That's what it is. I agree Perhaps. with you. I don't know how they it works, are. but the little eyes they do might do. And me the in. more we learn about them, the more. You know, mysterious they are in a way, and magical. Yeah, yeah, no, it's incredible. Those talks we've been going to, the one on the bee brain by Andrew Barton. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. Wow. You know, like, how do they? I mean, just how do they get it all in an organised community with? You know, they're, they're yeah. not like they're they're not a big insect. No. <laughs> like, and, and no, it's no. like a tiny little but, brain, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's a learning brain. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's incredible. Like the hive mind, I think they call it, don't they? When they're all working together. And well, yeah, that on that too, or Honeybee Democracy, that great book by Tom Seeley about yeah. how bees make decisions. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've mistakenly called the, the chief egg layer the queen. Yeah. It's not the right name for her because then we think she's the ruler and she's yeah. not. Yeah, she's definitely not. No, it's yeah. definitely a democracy. Yeah. Yeah. I feel sorry for the drones though. I think sometimes sometimes they've got a good <laughs> life, but most of the time in winter time they're they in trouble. With a bang. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly right. <laughs> and of course you've been busy giving back as well. I, I was reading that you've got um, like a project called Many Blossoms or uh, Billions of Blossoms. Billions of Blossoms. BB. Yeah. Billions of Blossoms. Yeah. That's come out of a few different things and meets a few different objectives, but the first one being from the from the beginning we've wanted our particularly our new bees the ones that hadn't kept bees before uh, which were uh, roughly 50 percent of our customers mm -hmm. to learn about beekeeping we were getting criticism and concern from beekeepers around the world saying hey you're making it look easy and we're going to get all these dead hives in a few months you know and we shared the same concern it wasn't like that but um a fair enough concern from the very beginning, we've put educational stuff on our website, encourage people to join bee clubs, hook up with local beekeepers, learn the craft, learn the care. As we went on, we realised, well, actually that could use its own dedicated site, all of that stuff. And so we created a site called thebeekeeper.org. And that's got interviews with a lot of people here, some of the speakers here, expert to, but experts from around the world. So it's a great site in terms of hearing from someone that's been really you know, for example, Randy Oliver from California, he's a scientist and a commercial beekeeper, and he's talking about nutrition and when bees are starving and the really subtle signs of when bees are hungry. So that's great to look at him, you know, and, and learn. And then you can, of course, because you've seen, for example, what he's about, you can go across to his website and learn more of his stuff. And the same for all of the different scientists and, and beekeepers that are on that site. So it's a learning tool. And that's the primary thing. But we decided from the beginning, now we're going to put half the profits into pollinator habitat preservation and creation because the pollinators around the world are possibly in trouble. Well, they are, but we don't know how much trouble. That, and that is real trouble. We don't know how much we don't know yes. about how pollinators and insects in general are going. Mm -hmm. All we know is that they seem to be declining and declining alarmingly but we don't, in Australia, we have no baseline studies of any of our insects. Yeah. Baseline meaning what were the insect populations like yeah. mm -hmm. when whiteys came. Yeah. We, don't, we don't know. It's the haphazard studies that have come on insect populations all seem to be showing decline. Mm -hmm. And um, that is very, very serious. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, pollinators are across the board. I mean, it's not just honeybees. I mean, the pollination world is like everything yeah. to, from the bees to the butterflies to the, to everything. And, and I mean, my thought is with insects, they're kind of like the canary in the coal mine a little bit. Like they're trying to tell us something that maybe we're not listening to. Mm. Like as, a, as mm. you know, we're, we're so far up the food chain and I guess technically in our minds, they're down here somewhere, but they're not. They're yeah. trying to, they're screaming a signal and maybe we should start listening. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we're risking, we're risking um, the viability of the ecosystems on Earth without insects, and that means, you know, we won't survive. Mm. You know, it's, well, we're definitely so, eating some horrible food <laughs> without right. pollinators. I mean, coal or something. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so we've wanted to preserve that, um, and yes, now three or four hundred thousand dollars has been going to that so far. That's just in a year or so of this beekeeper.org. So we're confident we'll be able to keep putting that sort of money in every year. And we're tending to be helping small groups with integrity. Um, so in my talk, I talked about the Yukon, who are um, 
who are a group in Ecuador working with communities in the Amazon basin where there's been a lot of logging, a lot of mining, a lot of devastation. That organisation is helping communities replant their area which is thousands and thousands of acres per indigenous community with, with uh, fruit bearing native trees. So it's ensuring their survival into the future, it's improving their soil again, it's carbon drawdown, it's pollinator and habitat, it's all, all rolled into one. And many of these organisations also put a fair bit of intention into, well, who's doing the maintenance and how is that community going? Does that community, as a community, need support or has it been sort of mining and stuff can put a lot of stress on a community. Some people have money, some people don't. It can blow a community apart. Yes. And yeah. uh, so there's, that attention has to be paid alongside the planting of the trees. Yeah. So um, it's important to us that the projects we support have, have that integrity and the long-term sort of sustainability, but also our pollinator houses that we make from the, from the scraps of the flow hive. Right, yeah. So from the factory scraps, because they're all made in Australia, recut these, them into these smaller little, cute little pollinator hotel boxes. And they're very, very popular. And all the profits from those go into pollinator programs as well. Oh, very cool. Mm. Well, that's amazing. Mm. There you go. Waste not, want not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's the funny thing. Cedar and I both, well, you know, it's in our family to, to scrounge and make do with. And so to find ourselves in the position where if we want a tool, we can buy the best. Because yep. you should. Yep. If, you've got, if you've got the resources, it's better to buy a really good quality tool. Yes. And he and I both still hesitate and go, oh, I reckon we can get around it by doing this. And <laughs> we're going, what? You know, yeah. wake up, don't waste our time. But, you know, it's, yeah. it's just a habit to, to, um, to make do. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was brought up on that. Yeah. My mum particularly was one of those. That can happen. I mean, my, yeah, that comes comes from an upbringing, doesn't it? And, and yeah. living that experience, yeah. it's hard to, I don't know, move on or, and I think it's also, it's, it's nothing wrong with staying There's with it. nothing that wrong with it. Being, Long, you know, and, it's, and, it's that awareness of it. So like sometimes, yeah, we might as well, like, let's, let's use these scraps. We don't want them thrown away. Let's turn them into a pollinator hive or wooden spoons or whatever. Let's do that. And other times it's, don't waste our time with, that shonky drill set, get proper ones that yep. you know, actually last and yeah, actually work. Yeah, exactly. And nothing worse than a jolly spanner that's not quite the right exactly. size that it's meant to be. Exactly. Yeah. Because no. yeah. I mean, when I got our flow hive, the instructions that you have in it are very, very, you know, like informative. Yeah, we you were put saying. a lot of work into yeah, that definitely. to try and make it. Yep, to make sure that everybody had the idea that you are responsible for the brood nest. And, yeah. you know, that is, you know, the flow hives are cool. And, you know, like, and the fact you don't need a honey harvesting device but you still can't ignore the ladies downstairs that are, you know absolutely not. You know, and that's quite specified in your instructions about you know and and even better now that you have a website that people can go to and yeah. get that more information and yeah yeah, yeah well it's great there's always more to learn isn't there yeah. the more oh. you learn the more you realize you've got more to learn <laughs> yeah yeah well exactly you know, right it's so. amazing and i think it's opened up a whole nother world to to hobbyist beekeepers, yeah. which is, I think it's a great thing. Myself, personally, I think more beekeepers the better, because I know when I first started keeping right. bees, I didn't really think so much about the flowers and the environment and, the, yeah. and, and every other aspect that starts coming into that whole thing. And if we can get people passionate about that, well, heck, that's got to be a good thing, doesn't it? Uh, awesome. Thank you very much. That's great. You're very welcome. Thanks for Lovely spending the time.